Does truth exist? Because you have faith, does that make this book true? Does God exist? So when someone says there is no truth, if you apply the claim to itself, what should you say? Is that true? They don't think Christianity is true. They're talked out of it. You know why they're talked out of it? Because they've never been talked into it. Cross-examining skeptical and atheistic views. Welcome to Cross-Examine with Dr. Frank Turek. Near-death experiences. Are they real? Is there any way to verify that they're real? What sort of implication do these near-death experiences have on Christianity if they are real? Do they prove or disprove Christianity? Do they prove or disprove naturalism? Where should we look to or who should we look to for evidence for the afterlife? These are all questions we're going to deal with today. And before we do, I want to give uh, a acknowledgement to all the people out there serving in the United States military or those that have served in the military. I have two sons right now in the United States Air Force on this Memorial Day weekend. Thank you for your sacrifice. And I also want to acknowledge the people out there who are protecting us inside this country police officers, FBI agents, uh, law enforcement. Thank you for your sacrifice as well. And as you all know, at the very center of Christianity is sacrifice. And so you people out there who are sacrificing or potentially sacrificing yourselves for your nation, either by protecting us from evil inside the country or evil outside the country, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you have done. All right, back now to my uh, the topic today of near-death experiences. You know, one of my favorite people, not just in apologetics, but my favorite people in all the world, is a man by the name of Dr. Gary Habermas. And many of you know Dr. Habermas because he's the world-renowned expert in the resurrection. We've had him on the show several times. He's, he's taught for nearly 40 years at Liberty University. He has probably um, researched more on the resurrection than any human being in history, And uh, we've had programs on this before, but today we're going to talk about another topic in which Gary has been very, very diligent. Uh, And it's about this concept of near-death experiences. He's researched it, he's written about it, and he's going to help us navigate through what can be a little bit confusing and a little bit scary, let me be honest with you, a little bit scary topic, because... How can you verify these things? Somebody says heaven's for real. They go to, they say they go to heaven and they and they come back and tell us about it. How do we know they're not making it up? Is there any way of figuring that out? So we're bringing in the expert, Dr. Gary Habermas. Gary, how are you? Doing well, Frank. That was an unbelievable introduction. I mean, not not saying, oh wow, rubbing my uh, chest or something. Not that. Just to be associated with an event like the resurrection, when you think about it is the, I mean, there's nothing like it. So to be cl- to be a close to it and to realize that when I was working through my doubts, uh, it was what brought me out of it. It was a very selfish thing for me. I wanted to answer my own questions. And just to do that and say, wow, uh, I, I guess I picked the major subject to study back then, but I sure wasn't aware of it. You picked so, the subject, Gary, not just a major is. subject. You picked these. I remember yeah. this must be 15 or 20 years ago. You go, look, all I do is the resurrection. I said, Gary, <laughs> you well, couldn't I do anything more way, important. Because when we, when we go to conferences and, and there are certain guys who will do any of 25 topics, and if you will let them prepare ahead of time a little bit more than normal, they can do another 25, you know? Uh-huh. And someone says, what do you do? And I'll say, what aspect of the resurrection do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done that so well, and you've helped so many people by so many of your uh, insights into the resurrection, whether it be minimal facts or whether it be uh, uh, the creeds. And I know you're about to teach a new course on the creeds there at Liberty. Right. But you you also, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the book that is sold the most in your hit book about the Shroud of Turin? Oh, yeah, easily, easily. You so you, I mean, so, you're an expert so there. Easily, Frank, that if you'd asked me the question this way, Gary, what book has sold the most for you? I'd say, uh, Historical Jesus, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, or my book on today's topic with J.P. Moreland, Beyond Death. Those three are big sellers. And then if you would come back and say, hey, what about the Shroud? 
I'd say, man, Frank, I left it out. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about it. Yeah, it was a long time ago, 1981, and it was an international bestseller. But now, now how did you get involved then in near-death experiences, at least in terms of investigating them? How, how did this happen? Well, Frank, let me, let me draw a parallel here before we start. Some people, I wonder if someone's listening, maybe very, very few people, but if someone's listening and saying, come on, guys, the topic's NDEs. Why aren't we getting there? You know, the reason I moved from resurrection to NDEs is because there's a, there's a, I don't want to get too spiritual, but say it biblically, you'd say there's a scarlet ribbon between the two. Say it secularly, and you'd say there's a yellow brick road between the two. What, what, do, I, what do I mean? I mean, the path from resurrection to eternal life is why we study resurrection. Mm -hmm. Re uh, resurrection is tied to the believer's resurrection, New Testament, almost 20 times. Well, res uh, outside of picking a Bible verse on, on eternal life and doing an uh, exegesis, NDEs is going to be the most prominent form of that today. So to me, NDEs is an extension to resurrection, because you can either argue from NDEs to the resurrection, i.e., it would look like this in one sentence, there's an afterlife. Hey, have you considered the resurrection? You know, because if, if, if there's this field called afterlife open, quit giving me your baloney objections to the resurrection. There's already that field open. Or you can go the other way. If the resurrection happened, hey, have you been doing any thinking about the afterlife? And mm -hmm. either way, the two are connected together. So really, it is, it is an extension of the topic I've been doing all my life. Well, I first really, I mean, I, I heard about these long ago, even before I was really a Christian. I heard about uh, a book called Heading Toward Omega. This had to be 25. Oh, yeah, I know maybe, that author. Yeah. Maybe 30 years ago. And then when you brought it up, I said, I wonder if there's any merit to these things. And then you see these these books and these movies, Heavens for Real. They sell millions or hundreds of thousands of copies. I don't know. And then the, and the movie's really popular and yep. people are really... Uh, thinking that this really happened, and and how do we, uh, what what do we do with this as Christians? So let's 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 start by talking about Gary. First of all, these near death experiences, um, there's thousands of them that people claim to have. What are the general conditions when people have these? Are they are they flatlined? No brain waves? What 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 is it? Yeah, they come in different forms. And by the way, Frank, in the latest medical book uh, on the subject. Almost all uh, medical writers from a state university press. So that should tell you something here. We're not talking about, you know, um, I'm not putting down Sunday school, but it's not Sunday school 101. It has made its way into the mainline science. And Frank, that book starts out with a comment. I think it's on the cover or something, but it says, uh, it might be, I think it's written the forward. And it says, recent survey show that between nine and 20 million Americans claim to have experienced near-death or near-death phenomena. Mm. It could be 20 million. This is very, very common. Now, and of course, the skeptics are going to sit there and go, prove it. And that's exactly the way we go after it. If 20 right. million have it, how many are you going to cross out? How many are you going to say, ma'am, I'm really sorry. You had this experience while you are delivering your child, which is very common. Mm -hmm. And... And uh, they'll say, well, it totally changed my life. And I'll say, well, any evidence? No, no, I, I don't care. I don't care at all about evidence. I can just tell you something. I was out of my body. I don't care what you think about it. I'm as sure I was out of my body as I was that I bought a loaf of bread in the uh, food store last night. I mean, you go, well, how do you know? And you go, ah, duh, I was there. Right. And that's impressive. But I think... The most impressive ones are the ones that come in about five categories of evidence. Um, you've got people who, who give evidence or reports having seen what went on in the room, i.e. an operating room. Um, secondly, what went on while they were in the operating room, maybe, but at a distance, maybe even miles away. Well, hold the thought, Gary, because we're coming sure. up on a break. Okay. Um, you're talking about out-of-body experiences that can be verified, and that's one of the roads we're going to go down here. We're talking to Dr. Gary Habermas about near-death experiences. Are they real? And if they are, 
Do they prove Christianity, disprove Christianity, disprove naturalism maybe? Those are the questions we're going to answer, uh, so don't go away. You're listening to Cross Examine with Frank Turek. We're back in two. Thank you for listening to the Cross Examine podcast. This material is made available to you for free by the contributions of listeners like you. If you wish to support future podcasts, just go to crossexamine.org and click on the donate button or simply use the donate feature directly on our app. Thanks. If you're low on the FM dial looking for national public radio, go no further. We're actually going to tell you the truth here. We're talking about near-death experiences with my friend Dr. Gary Habermas. You're listening to Cross-Examined with Frank Turek on the American Family Radio Network. Our website is crossexamined.org. That's crossexamined with a D on the end of it. And uh, just before the break, Gary, we were talking about ways that we can verify whether a near-death experience really occurred. Uh, and you were you went through two of five different kinds of near-death experiences. Why don't you start at the top, and we'll go through all five. Sure. Uh, the first two would be the common ones that you hear the most about, but they could also be the most evidential. One would be things people notice in the operating room while they claim to be, say, very commonly, above their body and looking down. Um, and I give examples of these. Second one, let's take the same scenario, although it's far from the only one. They're in the room being operated on, and they, their consciousness, they say, as is often described, it goes to where their family is. So if the family's 10 floors away in the hospital, uh, in a waiting room, they go there. Or the family member they're interested in lives two miles away and couldn't make it to the hospital during the surgery. They report things that they see where their family is. Um, so at a distance. In the room, at a distance. A third kind, these are rarer, and the evidence, frankly, isn't as good as some of the other categories, but there's enough things here to throw into the conversation. Um, Near-death experience is claimed by persons who are blind. Mm -hmm. And especially blind congenitally, like from birth. Some cases they're blind from just minutes after birth because in the old days, uh, I'm just guessing here, but I think prior to 1950, it was it was pretty common to put premature babies in incubators. And what the, the air, something about the oxygen they were using in the incubators made these little babies go blind. Oh. And so they were blind from the time they were put in the incubators, which is, you know, basically the same as being blind from, uh, from birth. birth. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, a fourth case, very intriguing, is uh, just a very few cases where healthy people observe the NDE of the dying person. So a healthy person or person say they're present, and they can they can corroborate data because the the one the one additional or more additional people say they were um, uh, there with them. And one case is the nurse. Uh, one case is five family members, believe it or not, um, and they watch. The last one is kind of the twilight zone near-death case, and that's the case where I'll just make up the scenario. Um, somebody is close to death, and they lose them, quote-unquote, and no no heartbeat, no brain, uh, brain wave, and they claim to see a family member. Let's make a dad or mom, and they see a family member who's plainly dead because they were buried, and you can go visit their tombstone today if you want, and they died 22 years ago or 11 years ago or whatever, and the person appears, they know in a heartbeat it's dad, they know in a heartbeat it's mom, but the person who looks like the identical twin of their parent uh, is lively and vivacious, but the most interesting thing is not, oh, wow, they look alike. Uh, that's kind of a dog kind of comment. But 
the person who died goes on to explain something that they did not know. And it might be a prophecy. Oftentimes, I say prophecy, not like biblical prophecy, but it might be a comment like, uh, hey, you guys don't know this yet, but your Uncle John, who's over in Iraq, uh, you're going to be getting a, a telegram tomorrow telling you that he passed away. I'm really mm. sorry to be the one to tell you that, but he just passed away in, in, in war. And uh, next day they get a telegram. Mm. Uh, but they, in the meantime, they've gone home and told people, so it's not something they just make up. And uh, the telegram comes. So the yeah. person who is definitely dead, but someone says, yeah, but you were dead when you had it. That's why it's called near-death experience. <laughs> right. You're right. Mm-hmm. But what about the person who's been gone for a long time and gives them some of this evidence? Well, I, I have heard of those categories that you mentioned. In fact, I just taught uh, through a miracles course uh, or a, a miracle series we did for TV, and we just covered near-death experiences. And I I didn't have as many categories. I, I put them in basically three. You mentioned one is the out-of-body experience, then also blind people seen. And then, as you just mentioned, people seen dead people who they didn't know had died, like just a... Uh, somebody maybe they lost touch with or yep. it happened very recently and they didn't know about it. Why don't we start with the out of body experiences, Gary? What what is a, a good a, example of this that has been verified an out of body experience where they're observing something that can be verified that uh, that that we can say, hey, this person really had remote viewing. They were outside of their body and saw this. And that's the only way to explain it. Well, uh, Frank, you know, seriously, I'll, I will be glad to jump in there and do that. The, the issue is there are so many different kinds. I could tell you one, and someone could say, yeah, it's not bad. I really wish she told me one of these. Oh, well, I wish she told me. I would have told you one of those. There's so <laughs> many of them that it's going to catch everybody, the, the uh-huh. of evidence. Now, um, let, let's take one uh, uh, right, right near the person. There's a case, um, an evidence case, where a person is in surgery, in a surgical ward, and the the cases, I will preface my comment by saying this, um, the cases are especially evidential when one of two things is going on with the person who has the NDE. Um, The first one is, if if that person is under general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Now, some people hear things. In anesthesia, but general anesthesia, when you shut down the entire body, that's a lot more serious category than, you know, filling a tooth and you wake up and the tooth has been pulled and you didn't feel anything. I mean, yeah, you were out of it, but not like if they were going to take your gallbladder out. Right. Um, so one case is general anesthesia. And the other case, to me, more evidential is a few years ago, it was discovered that a person who has a cardiac arrest, now cardiac arrest comes in different species, but the species I'm interested in is the cardiac arrest involving um, fibrillation, heart uh, fibrillation, showing that the, the, the heart has actually, uh, uh, is actually dead. And so the person for a few moments, let's say two minutes, the person is uh, would have a flat brain reading. You can tell because of the car type of heart attack they're having, or it might show up on the machine. So the flat heart, Frank, in 14.4 seconds on average in one experiment, the person who was flat uh, uh, brain waves, measurably flat, you could say, oh, maybe they got something going on there, but measurably flat on the machine because the cardiac arrest was caused by ventricular uh, fibrillation. Uh, okay, so the heart stops. Less than 15 seconds later, your brain stops working. Mm-hmm. So if this guy saw something that was, uh, let's say, three minutes later, demonstrably, because we know the time, we know when the heart attack happens on the machine, it's on the uh, um, EKG, and we know when the event they reported, I'll just make some crazy thing up, an accident out in the parking lot that the police even come and check out. We know the times. And if you're out for more than like two minutes, it's a quote unquote flat brain, flat heart experience. Now, again, I caution, it's a measurably flat brain, flat heart. But it's amazing, Frank, how much they trust these machines when no one's doing anything with religion. 
And then when spirituality or afterlife comes in, all of a sudden they will literally tell you that's if the machine was working. That's <laughs> if it got everything. Right. Oh, you hear that all the time. Right, okay, sure. Okay, so let me give you a case or two of these things. But when they're in that, those states I'm telling you about, they're the most valuable. Okay, here's one. Um, a, a, fo- a, a, a person was being operated on in the operating room. And they went up above their body, and they're just curious. And they're just looking around. And they look through the wall. I don't know how far. Was it one room over? Was it two rooms over? I don't know. But they look through the wall, and they watch a man being operated on in another room. And the crazy thing, Frank, is that they were removing the man's leg. I mean, that's your normal kind of surgery. Right. And they're taking his leg off, and the, and the person's just fascinated. And they just describe the whole thing when they come back, starting with there's a guy in the next room having his leg taken off, which I don't think is normal, uh, you know, what you tell the person when they're going in just before they drift off. Sure. Uh, that's one. Uh, here's, another, here's another case or two from the room. There are people out there who say, well, we stuck, ra- we stuck random numbers up in the rafters with computers, and we've done that many times. And nobody's reported the, re- the, the random five-digit or three-digit number up on the screen. And, uh, okay, interesting, but uh, equally interesting is the case that people have reported, in order, large numbers from up above their beds. You go, like, what? Uh, Maybe they saw it while they were putting them out. Yeah, not this kind. Like, well, what do you have in mind? Well, one person was up above their body, and there was a quarter. I I don't know what it is, Frank, or fascination. Often it's the guys who have them. But they try to throw quarters up so that they land on small surfaces. <laughs> oh, quarters, yeah. nickels, right. pennies. Uh-huh. And the person looked, and they could tell the date on the quarter. You go, well, come on, a date on a quarter. That's probably going to be between 1980 and, 19- and 2018. Okay, mm-hmm. good. So you have a 1 in 38 chance of getting the number right. Uh, oh, wait a minute, though. But the century changes. Oh, yeah, okay, well, then in those cases, you have to add two more numbers. Now, it, the odds are really going to go up. So there's a quarter, but here's the one that gets me. In one published case, a woman said she was up above her body, and when she comes to, she's OCD. And she says, I'm obsessive compulsive, and I memorize large numbers when I see them. And she says, you see that machine over there, this tall machine we have that goes over everybody's head? Yeah. They're, and you know, in hospitals, how they rivet numbers onto the metal things to keep track oh, yeah. of them, you know? Yeah. Well, she said, she said there's a number on top, and uh, she says to the nurse, uh, hey, you got a pen and paper? Write this number down. I think we'll need it later. Three, four, six, seven, six, nine, nine. And she gives a nine. Uh, that's not the number, but she gives a yeah. twelve-digit number. Nurse writes it down. Doesn't pay much attention to it. A few days later, they're coming in. They need the machine somewhere else. They take the machine on a dolly or something. Take uh-huh. it out, and somebody jumps up and says, "Well, well, well! Before you take it, let's check that number." It's Hold on, Gary. Medical. Hold on. Let's wait till after the break because we're coming up against it again. We're talking to Gary Habermas about near-death experiences. What do you think that number was, friends? We're going to find out right after this with my friend, Dr. Gary Habermas. You're listening to Cross-Examine with Frank Turek back in two minutes. College campuses are hostile to the Christian faith, and three out of four young people walk away from the church once they go to college. That's why we go to college campuses and present I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist in the United States and even all over the world. When we do this, we don't charge students a dime. That's why we need your financial support. In fact, over the past couple of years, we've been able to grow dramatically because of your generous support. And 100% of your donations go to ministry. Zero percent go to building. So when you give to Cross Examined, you'll be giving to help us go reach young people where they are. Would you consider giving today? Thank you so much, and thank you so much for what you've done already. We're back with Dr. Gary Habermas. And Gary, during the break, said that was the uh, closest near-death experience he ever had on radio because we had to cut him off because we were heading up to the hard break. Nothing we can do about that. By the way, before... I forget. Uh, next week, I'm going to be out in, well, actually a couple weeks from now, I'm going to be out in uh, California, in Cupertino. You know, that's Silicon Valley there. I used to live out there, San Jose, when I was in the Navy. And uh, we're doing a Saturday service, or not a service, we're doing a seminar, if you will, 
uh, on, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and it's going to be at Abundant Life Church. Gee, I just had it in front of me. Now, suddenly, it's gone away. Where is it? Stand by for Vectors, Victor. I'm finding it. Uh, it is going to be, let's see, it's going to be, man, it was just in front of me. There it is. Uh, June 9th, and it's going to be at uh, Abundant Life Church in Cupertino, California. All the details are on our website and also the free app. So Saturday the 9th, uh, we'll be doing it from, I think, about 9 to 3 with a lunch break. And then Sunday, I'll be speaking at the church Sunday morning uh, at Abundant Life Church there in Cupertino. So everybody's welcome. Look forward to seeing you there in Cupertino, Northern California, Silicon Valley. So check that out. That's uh, June 9th and June 10th. 10th. All right, back to my friend, Dr. Gary Habermas. Dad, Gary, we're talking about near-death experiences. We're talking about veridical, they're called, veridical near-death experiences. It's taking somebody's word for it. We can actually verify that what they're telling us uh, actually is true because they see a quarter or something, or they see a uh, serial number on the top of a machine uh, right. that's uh, in the room. And so what happened with this lady who said she saw the serial number? Well, she said she said, I'm, I'm obsessed and compulsive. I have OCD, and I have a tendency to, to memorize large numbers. Mm-hmm. And she said, she said, see that machine there? Yeah. Well, on top of it, a number is riveted to the machine. And, you know, you can't just walk by and look at it. It's over your head. And um, she said the number is, and she gives the 13 numbers to a person standing there. Wow. Um, a little while later, they came and removed the machine for somebody else. And, and while they were taking it out, maybe putting it on a hand cart or a dolly and kind of lowering it a little bit, people could look at the top of it. And someone that heard that story said, hey, let me see that. And they checked the number. Um, she got the number exactly exactly correct. So now what's, you, you know, um, you got a quarter case. You got a case with a penny where the dates are correct. You got a... If you go 40 years on a coin, say 1980 to date, you got the change of the century mark, so that would make four possible numbers on those coins. Um, and what are the chances to hit a quarter, a penny, and this 12-digit number? Well, she got it right. Mm. And uh, it, it's amazing because uh, I it, this, this isn't me. I'll tell you somebody else's experience. But a very close friend of mine, a researcher, I've uh, heard of this case, and you know how magic fingers are. My PhD students are just incredible. I'll mention a book, and before I get two sentences out, they found it online, and they mm-hmm. send a website to everybody. Um, a person I know who, who decided to check this out, I'm not quite sure how they got the person's name, but they got the person's name of the nurse who was in the room who reported the 12-figure number, who wrote it down ahead of time, they emailed, the person responded to them, and they got a little bit of verification on the number. So, pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And um, so you got three numbers there uh, at random. You got an amputated leg. Um, one case was a lady who someone said to her after she came back from the surgery, they said, yeah, well, we've got that figure because you were already hooked up to a machine. And she said, I was not. And they said, you were too. The machine was in the room. She goes, yeah, well, go check your data. The machine was unplugged. And they went back and looked, and the machine that was supposed to be given the data was the plug was over in the corner and it wasn't sticking on the wall. Mm. Um, just just goofy things like that sometimes, but but those are the ones that are in the room. I personally prefer the ones that are at a distance, and some of these are so um, impressive because you wonder how can a person describe something that happens. Um, some of them, Frank, are, are hilarious. Uh, one of them, um, an actual case in a recent book on NDEs. In a couple of uh, books on evidence near-death experiences, in one case, a little girl who is is described as, as having no brain activity watches events that are going on in her home when her parents go back to the house. She's in, on machines and breathing uh, like, you know, an intensive care situation. And she tells where where her brother is and what he's doing, where her sister is, what she's doing, uh, what her dad's doing, and most of all, 
what her mom is making for dinner. And the doctors who are listening, one of whom uh, I interviewed myself, and he was an agnostic, he, uh, he said, whoa, 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 there's a point of contact. What's, uh, what, what was she making for dinner? And, and the little girl uh, told her, told him exactly what mom made for dinner. So when mom comes in to see her daughter, I mean, this just happened. So the doctor says, hey, can I ask you folks real quickly, what did you make for dinner two nights ago or one night ago? And the little girl was right. But the family lived miles from the hospital. And the girl was able to look in and, and correctly name what toy the boy was playing with, what her daughter, what her sister was doing, where her dad was seated, and what her mom was making for dinner. So she mm-hmm. gave the details uh, while she was plugged up to a machine breathing because they described her as being profoundly comatose, profoundly comatose without brain um, action. Measurable. We have to add that word all the time. Measurable brain action. Here's another yeah, one. Gary- Go ahead, go ahead. Give another one. Go ahead. Well, the other one, different book on evidential indie cases. A man drove to another city. He and his wife have special surgery, and he had a house sitter uh, many, many, many miles away, over a 1,000 miles away. And he had surgery, and during the surgery, he had a cardiac arrest. Okay, that's not good. Uh, Supposedly, you're going to be without brain, measurable brain or heart activity in, in 15 seconds. And he, somehow, his wife's right there in the hospital, but he looks in on how this uh, person is who's taking care of their home, and he gives extensive comments on what the person's doing in the home that day. Mm. And when he gets out of it, they, they revived him, and he was okay, and he survived the surgery. And he talked to his friend. He said, tell me something. What were you doing that afternoon? I was doing this and that. Well, the guy told him what he saw before the guy gave his testimony. And the guy was doing exactly that. But the key is, it was hundreds of miles away that he could wow. see. Now, my question is, how can we account for that naturalistic universe? Anyway. In fact, Frank, I, I'm not ready to talk about this yet, but I think it will be startling enough just to give a one-liner here. Um, a recent atheist has just said, if I can count a comment that someone sent me a quotation, a recent atheist has just said, I'm an atheist, but what in the world is wrong with me believing in afterlife? Mm. See, to me, that means that that's an indication that the walls are starting to come down. Yeah. Well, Gary, you mentioned books that you're getting these from. Can you recommend books to our listeners if they want to read more about NDEs? Where would they go? Well, uh, Frank, from, from, a, from a Christian perspective, I will tell you, probably the two best books on the subject are by um, a cardiologist named Michael Sabom, S-A-B-O-M, mm-hmm. and his first one was written, I believe, 1982, but still referred to as probably the most clearly investigated cases from a medical perspective, and um, give me a second on that. It's <laughs> Frank, maybe we can put that back in in just a second if you want to. No, 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 it's that. okay. I've got one, Gary, that, that I just came across, and I ran it by you first, and you said, yeah, that'd be a good one. Uh, in fact, I, I used it for the uh, TV uh, version, uh, the TV program we did on NDEs. It's called The Science of Near-Death Experiences. It's edited by uh, John Hagen, it looks like. And, What's the name? Uh, What's the name, Frank? H- Hagen, H-A-G-A-N, John Hagen. He's a medical doctor. And it basically, it, it, right. he's the editor. So there's chapters from all sorts of different – these are PhDs right. and doctors. They're not, you know – the father of the guy from from heaven uh, from heaven is no, real. No, no, I got you. Do you yeah, have the book decent. right there? Uh, yeah, I have it right here. It's is that, on is my that the book Kindle. from the University of Missouri Press? Uh, I'd have to look it up on Kindle. I'll do it during the break. It might be, but let me just mention one thing I noticed here. I uh, the, this Doctor Jeffrey Long. He's an MD. In one he, of the chapters yeah. of this book, Gary, and you you might be familiar with it. He goes through nine lines of evidence to, to, to right. say that uh, near-death experiences are medically inexplicable. And here's what he says. Right. I'm, I'm quoting from page 78. He says, any one or several of the nine lines of evidence would likely be reasonably convincing for many scientists. But the combination of all 
the presented nine lines of evidence provides powerful evidence that NDEs are, in a word, real, unquote. Now, some of the nine lines of evidence are what we've been talking about, this remote viewing or the blind scene or seeing yep. a person who's recently deceased, yet the NDE or didn't know the person's recently deceased. So all this right. fits as these things really being real. Yeah, now he's, he's very well known. His study, he's an oncologist, his, his study is said to be the one that has more NDE cases than any other previous study, thousands of cases. Now, which of, the book, which of his books is that, Frank? Uh, the Science of Near-Death Experiences. This is a edited book. Uh, this is Jeffrey Long as a chapter writer in that edited book, so or edit, uh, a book of collected uh, chapters, so it's not his okay, personal book. Okay, now do you have to find out if that's the University of Missouri book? Yeah, I'll, I'll look at it during the break and see if it is. If uh, it is, that's the book I cited that has 9 to 20 million American cases. So it's a, it's a you know, highly... Uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten it yet. It, okay. Someone just told me about it, I'm ordering it. Uh, University but, of Missouri, you say? Huh? That's correct. Yeah, if that's it. If that's it, that's the book I... It I is, University of Missouri Press, Press, Columbia, edited by John well, that's, C. That's, Hagen. That's the book. That's okay. The book. Now, the only thing is, Frank, Notice when you ask the question, we're not taped, right? Yeah, no, yeah, we were still taping. Go. Yeah. Okay. All right. But wait a minute. Um, we're coming up to another break, Gary. I don't want to give you another near-death experience on radio. So just hang all on. Right. We're all talking right. about near-death experiences with my friend, the great Dr. Gary Habermas, who, as you know, has studied the resurrection probably more than anybody in history. But he studied also aspects of the resurrection or things that may impinge or are related to the afterlife, including the Shroud of Torin, and now including near-death experiences. And that's who we're talking to today. So when we come back from the break, uh, we'll talk more about near-death experiences with my friend, Dr. Gary Habermas. And don't forget, friends, uh, you can learn more about Gary Habermas at GaryHabermas.com. In fact, he has done several broadcasts on this issue and also on the resurrection you can listen to them or download them right off his website garyhabermas.com we're back with gary for more in just a minute don't go away i'm frank Durek. if you find value in the content of this podcast don't forget to follow us on facebook twitter and instagram where you can find more just type cross-examine or Frank Turek on the search bar. Also, visit our website where we add new videos, articles, and free resources daily. Near-death experiences, ladies and gentlemen, are they real? And what do they tell us about Christianity? What do they tell us about naturalism? We're going to cover that in the last segment here, I think. If the data is good and there are thousands of these near-death experiences, if just one of them is real, it seems anyway to disprove naturalism, at least, that we're just molecular machines because uh, you've got people remote viewing things when their body's on an operating room table, they're seeing things miles away. So that would seem to disprove naturalism, at least. And we were just talking about a book uh, called uh, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. Now, let me just say, I've read through most of this book. Uh, I don't even know if any of the people in the book are Christians. Some of them may be universalists. They think, well, gee, if they, everyone's going to have uh, some sort of afterlife experience and it's going to be a good experience. Well, not necessarily so. In fact, actually in this book, The Science of Near-Death Experiences, I want to say if I'm remembering properly, about 23% of the people who have near-death experiences have horrific near-death experiences. Now, the, the figure might actually be higher than that, because you if you have a horrific one, you might not want to report it. <laughs> but actually, Gary, you're, you're saying there's another book out there that's 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 pretty good on the subject. What is that book? Yeah, well, the earlier book by the fellow, there's two books by the name is Michael Sabom. He's a cardiologist. The first book is still said to be the best scientific investigation. You could, you know, you could maybe plug another one in there, but this is a good one. It's called Recollections of Death, colon, A Medical Investigation. Mm -hmm. Recollections of Death, the Medical Investigation, published by Harper. And um, it's been out for a while now. Um, as I recall, 1981 uh, is when the book came out. And uh, a doctor, and, and he actually has some checks and balances. He, he has some um, tests that he gives. And he also gives six 
specific kinds of reading numbers on instruments in the room while they're out and things like that. The same author wrote a book years later called Light and Death, not Life and Death, but L-I-G-H-T, Light mm. and Death, published by Zondervan, actually. And it's uh, another account of the afterlife from the near-death perspective, 1998. And more than most, Mike Sabom there answers a bunch of questions back in the back of the book about what does it say about other religions? Why do people seem to think they're going to heaven? Do Christians have deeper or better experience than non-Christians? Just wonderful, you know, great questions. But Light and Death, 1998, Zondervan is the other book by the same author, Michael Sabom. You know, Gary, for me, I know a lot of people are thrilled by movies like Heaven is Real or the book and that kind of thing. And look, right. that could be a real experience. I, I don't want to I'm not I'm not going to make a judgment on that. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, apparently that kid came back and said he saw his sister who was never born. It was a miscarried uh, sister of his and his right. parents never told him about it. So if right. that's really true, then that would be a veridical experience that he knew something in this experience that he didn't know before. And right. his parents verified it, but we're taking the parents' word for it at that point. But we are. Because yeah. Somebody could come out and say, Frank, here's what they're going to say. And they're probably correct. Mm -hmm. uh, some naturalists are going to say, look, look, look. So you had a, what was a, a, a little girl who was going to be a baby sister, and mom miscarried. You say she never told you. What's the likelihood that you never heard your parents talking about this over breakfast at one of your mini meals at home? You yeah. probably forgot about it. Now, right. to me, it's more evidential to hear someone say, "Hate to tell you this, but your uncle Bill just died in Afghanistan, and you're going to get the you're going to get the uh, telegram in exactly two days." And you mm -hmm. go home and tell everybody. Everybody can witness that you were all shook up after this experience, and the telegram came two days later. That that nobody knows that unless you want to say, "Oh, your best friend in the operating room is the general." You know, I mean, that's kind of silly. But, now, I know, Gary, that, and I've heard you say this before, that this doesn't prove or disprove Christianity, but it does seem right. to disprove naturalism. Unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't use near-death experiences to say that Christianity must be true. I mean, let me give an example. The Kalam cosmological argument is very common today. And a Christian apologist, man, it's pretty close to used by every sophisticated apologist. I would guess. But what if I told people that that was invented by Muslim philosophers in the Middle Ages? Yeah, right. Oh, no. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, Muslim philosophers. Why? Because they believe in God. So mm -hmm. there are evidences from people who believe in God, uh, Islam argument, intelligent design, near-death experiences. It's in that category. It's really difficult for naturalism, but everybody who believes in religion is standing shoulder to shoulder saying naturalists are wrong. Uh, now, you go, well, okay, then I have a couple of very tough remaining questions. How come nobody goes to hell? How come everybody has a near-death experience? Everything is rosy, um, and everybody tells you you can get, get to heaven, some universalistic response to your own religion. And I have a real general answer, but I think it holds. I've been using it for many years, and uh, it goes like this. NDEs are good for establishing an afterlife. And you go, well, how long? 45 minutes later? Well, even though, even that's hard for naturalism. Right. And some naturalists are coming around to believe in an afterlife right now because of it. But, uh, so yeah, it shakes people up. But some of these are days. You know, what do you do with somebody who gives evidence of something that happens days later? Or someone who's been dead for five years and gives the evidence. So it's not just 45 minutes and out. Okay, all right, fine. So we've got an afterlife. Now what kind? Sounds like anybody can get there. All right. How do you know anybody can get there? Oh, well, John said so, and John had an NDE. Right. You believe everybody who tells you, well, you want me to believe Christians when Christians say it. I did not say that. Here's what I said. I tend to believe people who have heavy doses of data in their response when things check out. But there's no, there's virtually no evidence to speak of for a person who talks about their religion being true, their God being the one who told them this, now, they could say, I met with Jesus, and someone else could say, I met with Moses, or I met with a, a, a Muslim, you know, some individual in Islam. They can say that, but that's their opinion. What right. do I expect them to You say, would you say that about Christians? I would. 
What if they said they saw Jesus? I would take it with a heavy grain of salt. There's epistemic issues. How would you know Jesus? If he, did he tell you that was his name? No, but I just sensed that he was the greatest being of love I ever met. Yeah, we call those angels. I mean, it, you know, we, we don't we don't know. So I don't know what religion. When someone says, "I, I tell you what religion is true," it doesn't follow from the, from sawing off legs in the room next door, watching what your parents are doing at home while you're out of it, uh, watching hundreds of miles away in your home. None of that prescribes a religion. So I don't think NDEs tell you one religion is more true than another. Mm. Well said. And I think what we ought to do, and I think you'd agree, obviously, is that we may look at NDEs as evidence, more evidence that naturalism is wrong. There's, there's, right. <laughs> there's a lot of other evidence that shows us naturalism is wrong. Right. Uh, the very fact that there's evidence at all shows that we're not just molecular machines, that we can follow reason where it leads us. But, but it does say that, okay— Naturalism is wrong, but if, we're, if we want to know about the afterlife, we've got to go to somebody who's been there and come back, and that would be Jesus. <laughs> right? yeah, and then they're going to start getting upset with you. But yeah, but then what are you going to do with the evidence? Mm-hmm. Let, let's introduce the evidence for the resurrection now. Exactly. That, that does give up specific religion, because, you know, it'd be really strange if Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion who was raised from the dead, which he is, the only major founder of world religion, so he's even believed to be raised from the dead, which he was. And he and the God of the universe has claimed that he raised him from the dead, but he was a heretic because he claimed he'd be the Son of God and the only path to salvation. He was neither. That doesn't add up. People don't like the second conclusion because they don't like where the conclusion's going, not because they can refute the data. Gary, is it possible, too? I'm just throwing this out here that. There are people like, who was it, Eben Alexander, the guy who, uh, who was the neurologist right. who went into yeah. meningitis, and he had this elaborate sort of uh, experience, and right. uh, he uh, he finally thinks that there's an afterlife, but I think he's kind of a universalist. I think he's, I think he's kind of a universalist, and uh, he, uh, he basically thinks that we're all going to get to heaven somehow, heaven is real, and all these things. It, but let's let's suppose for the sake of argument that experience he had was true. Yep. Could that have been induced by a, a demon? Well, okay. So you're going to say that about all Indies? I don't know. I'm just asking the question. I mean, yeah, if, no, it I would, I if it contradicts, if it contradicts Christ, for a, for a few reasons. Um, one is, if it's a demon, you have automatically. All right. So use the Kalam argument. Muslims love it. Okay, Christians are going to use it too. Now we got God. All right, now you have NDEs. Wow, that's the second uh, bulwark of na- uh, against naturalism. We have life after death now. No, it's not life after death. It's the demons. Ah, that's a third supernatural category. Oh, I know. And, uh, yeah. All the time, naturalism's losing. That's all right. If there are demons, if there yeah. are angels, if there's a God, if there's an afterlife, hey, look out, because the naturalistic worldview is caving in. So I wouldn't go there, because you're not going to get away from the problem. You're still going to have the supernatural. No, no, I, I, I agree with that. It, it is, it is still a do. problem for naturalism. I'm just saying that Christians might say, well, or people out there might say, well, if, if, if the, you have a universalist NDE, sure. then maybe universalism is true. And I'm saying, well, I think the better evidence is from Christ. And if, if it contradicts, if an NDE contradicts Christ, I'm not going with the NDE. I'm going with Christ. Ah, now that, now that is a really good argument, Frank. Yes. Um, so what are you going to do? Are you going to believe the guy says, I got this feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired of judgment, and I don't think God's going to judge anybody? And what's your source? I don't know. Good ethics. Really? Does good ethics demand that? I don't know. I'm just telling you what you like. Ah, okay. Now what about the resurrection? Well, I'm not so crazy about that story, because only Christians <laughs> win. But who's the, who's the one teaching this? Jesus. Who was raised from the dead? Jesus. Who's the only one in the history of religion raised from the dead? Jesus. So you already believe in afterlife because of NDEs, but now you're open to Jesus having been there. Man, you are just about to close the door totally on Christianity being, I mean, not against, but for Christianity being true. Right. Um, yeah, combine, that's where we started this program. We combine NDEs with resurrection, and you've got a whale of an apologetic for Now you can add the word Christian to afterlife. Gary, this is beautiful. I 
And we're out of time again, man. But always okay. having you on is so great. You guys, you do such a great job on everything you do, brother. So thanks for being on well, the show. Well, I enjoy it. That's because, Frank, go back to the beginning of the program. That's because you keep getting me on the one or two topics on top of it. Ah, you're good. You're good. We got to go, Gary. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm Frank Turner. Thanks. We work hard to create great content and deliver truth and valuable insights to all of our cross-examined podcast listeners. If you agree, take 30 seconds out of your busy schedule to leave us a five-star rating so more people like you can find us. Just look for the cross-examined official podcast, three words on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. We are truly grateful for your support. 